Hello to everyone, welcome. Welcome to all women, global wide, and welcome in this new week. Today, it's the daughter in law of Judah, Tamar. This is your pastor, Yeti. Her name means date tree or palm tree. A character driven by one overwhelming need. She sacrificed her reputation and nearly her life to achieve her goals. Her sorrow that the man in her life failed to fulfill their responsibility, leaving her a childless widow. Her joy, that her daring behavior resulted not in ruin, but in the fulfillment of her hopes to bear children. And the key scriptures are Genesis 38 and Matthew chapter 1 verse 3. Her story, genealogies hardly make compelling reading at bedtime or at any other time for that matter. Perhaps you welcome them with a yawn or skip over them entirely as you read through the Bible. But even long lists of bewildering names can reveal interesting insights into God's mysterious plan. That's the way the scriptures work, yielding hidden riches on average page. I mean on every page. Take the genealogy in the first chapter of Matthew, for instance. It lists a grand total of 41 male ancestors of Jesus, beginning with Abraham, and in Mer, five female ancestors, three of whose stories, those of Tamar, Rahab, and Bethsaida, are colored by such distasteful details as incest, prostitution, fornication, adultery, and murder. Jesus, the perfect son of the perfect father, had plenty of imperfect branches in his family tree and enough colorful characters to populate a modern romance novel. That women should be mentioned at all in his genealogy is surprising let alone that four of the five get pregnant out of wedlock. In addition, at least three of the women were foreigners in, um, I mean, and not Israelites. Tamar fell into both categories. Her father-in-law, Judah, the son of Jacob and Leah, had arranged for her to marry her firstborn, Er, half Canaanite and half Hebrew. Er was a wicked man whom God killed for his sins. That's all we knew and we know of him. After Er, came Onan, Judah's second son. As was the custom of the time, Judah gave Onan to the widowed Tamar, instructing him to sleep with her so that she could have children to carry on Er's line. But Onan was far too crafty for his own good. He slept with Tamar, 
who then spilled his semen on the ground, thus ensuring Tamar's barrenness. That way he could not be saddled with the responsibility for children who would carry on his brother's line rather than his own. But God took note and Onan too died for his wickedness. Already Judah had lost two sons to Tamar. Should he risk a third? Shelah was his only remaining son, not yet fully grown. To placate his daughter-in-law, Judah instructed Tamar to return to her father's house and live as a widow until Sheila was of marriageable age. But time passed like a sludged river and Tamar continued to wear her widow's garments as Sheila grew up. I mean, Selah grew up. After Judah's wife died, he set out one day for Timnah to cheer his sheep Hearing the news of her father-in-law's journey, Tamar decided to take desperate and dramatic actions. If Judah would not give her his youngest son in marriage, she would do her best to propagate the family name in her own way. Shedding her widow's black, she disguised herself in a veil, impersonating a prostitute, and sat down beside the road to Timna. Judah slept with her and gave her his personal seal and cord along with the staff in pledge of future payment. About three months later, Judah learned that Hamar was pregnant. Little realizing he was responsible for her condition. Outraged that she had prostituted herself, he ordered her burned to death. But before the sentence could be carried out, Tamar sent him a stunning message. I am pregnant by the man who owns these. See if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. The man who had so quickly passed judgment, little heeding his own secret, triced with a prostitute, was suddenly taken up short. To his credit, he told the truth, saying, She is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son, Sheila. Six months later, Tamar gave birth to twins. Once again, as with Jacob and Esau, the children struggled in her womb. A tiny hand came out and then disappeared, but not before being tied with the scarlet thread by the midwife. Then a small, slippery body emerged, but with no trace of the red trait. She named the first boy Perez, meaning breaking out. Then the little one with the scarlet ribbon was born, and they named him Zerach, meaning scarlet. Perez was recognized as the firstborn. From his line, would come King David, and finally, hundreds of years later, Jesus of Nazareth. Judah had shown little concern regarding the continuance of his line. Instead, God used a woman, shamed by her own barrenness and determined to overcome it, to ensure that the tribe of Judah would not only survive, but that it would one day bear the world's Messiah. 
your life and times. As abhorrent as it seems to us, prostitution was actually an expression of worship in the ancient Near East. Pagan peoples often believed that fertility gods granted blessings to those who practiced the cultic prostitution. The sacrifices and the payments for the use of a cult prostitute brought huge amount of money into the covers of the god or goddess being worshipped. The sexual intercourse itself symbolized the hoped for fertility and abundance for the harvest. Judah, a widower who had only recently recovered from his grief, traveled to Timnah during sheep cheering time to watch his own sheep being cheered off their wool. It may be that when he saw Tamar, he took her for the shrine prostitute and had intercourse with her to ensure a good crop of wool. That hardly justifies Judah's act, but it may shed light on his motives. Shrine prostitutes usually kept themselves heavily veiled before and during the act of intercourse an attempt to create the illusion that the participant was actually engaging in the sexual act or the goddess herself. This practice worked in Tamar's favor, giving her the perfect disguise so that her father-in-law would never recognize her. Prostitution was the imagery used often by the biblical prophets to describe Israel's waywardness, their proneness to follow false gods. They saw God as the husband of Israel, her keeper and her true love, whenever the Israelites turned from the true God to the false gods. They prostituted themselves. It is a strong picture, but an accurate one, of turning away from the God who truly loved them and was willing to care for them and watched over them. If only they would remain true to him. Tamar's story takes us by surprise, repulses us, we recall from the sordid details of prostitution and find little to inspire us. Yet stories like Tamar's are what make the Bible so believable. Who would ever invent such a thing? Then record it not only in the historical narrative, but also in the lineage of the Messiah. Only the God of eternal surprises, the God who takes the unfit, the desperate, and the profane, and uses them to his eternal and holy purpose. Read in your time Genesis 38 verse 1 to 30 and Matthew 1 verse 3. Onan was supposed to father children through Tamar for his brother, Er. This is the same act as that of the kinsman redeemer found in the book of Ruth. The closest of kin was a father a child to carry on the line of the deceased husband. None of the men in Tamar's life fulfilled their responsibilities to her including her father-in-law, Judah. Describe what you think Tamar was feeling throughout the course of their events. And in that culture, a woman's whole worth 
was in bearing sons to carry on the family line. The woman who failed in that was nothing. What makes you feel your worth a lot or not much? And when you consider that Tamar did in offering herself disguised as a prostitute to her father-in-law, do his words in verse 26 surprise you? Why or why not? Explain what Judah meant by these words. And the story of Tamar is tough to digest. There is simply no way to assimilate what she did with our current way of thinking. And yet Matthew makes a point of mentioning her in Christ's lineage. What do you think God is saying by including her this story in the inspiring scriptures and her place in Jesus' human heritage? How has God worked good out of the bad things that have happened to you or the bad things you've done? And the promise. The story in Genesis 38 reveals nothing about Tamar's knowledge of God's hand in the events of her life. More than likely, she was totally unaware of the power of God at work. But he was at work, nevertheless, bringing good out of tragedy and blessing out of less than honorable events. That's the beauty of this story. God's power to bring positive things from the negative, even sinful, events of our lives is just as much as work now as in Tamar's day. We may not see it today or tomorrow, or perhaps ever, but we can trust the God we love to do what He loves, bring blessing to us in spite of ourselves. And the promises in scriptures I'll give you some not one of all the good promises <coughs> excuse me the Lord your God gave you has failed every promise has been fulfilled not one has failed Joshua 23 14 your ways O God are holy but God is so great as our God Psalm 77 13 and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. You can find that in the New Testament in the genealogy of Christ, Matthew 1, verse 3. Reflect on Genesis 38 and praise God that he allowed his own son to be intimately linked with fallen human beings from whom he was descended. Give God thanks that God can use everyone in everything to bring about a good result. And confess any tendency you may have to judge others with a double standard, as Judah did with Tamar. And ask God to take any desperation you may be feeling and replace it with hope, calling to mind the verse in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plan to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And then lift up your heart 
If you've never sketched out your family tree, make an effort to trace your heritage, if possible, of course. Going back at least four or five generations, more if you have the time and energy, because it's a lot of work. Ask all the relatives to supply as much information as possible about your ancestors. Pay special attention to the women in your family tree. Take notes on everything you discover. Then describe all the information into a keepsake book that can be passed along to your own children after you're gone. Include any photos and news clippings you can find. You may discover some fascinating insight into your family background. Let us end in prayer. Lord, you formed us in our mother's womb. You knew then what every single day of our life would be like. You saw the great things and the hard things, the joy and the sorrow. Right now we come before you with the situation and you can fill whatever you want to fill in as in a memory with which we have not yet made peace. As we look back at painful circumstances, help us to realize that you were present even in the midst of them. And now as I surrender and we surrender them to you, help us to sense your healing presence in our lives. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Make it serious in your life how important you are and what was before you and before them and so on. It will stop judgment. It will stop a lot of negativity as we getting a better understanding where we come from. And why did they do something that was not pleasant or what was just joyful and with a lot of happiness? Bind these all things together and find out. That will give you always a better view on your future and for your own children or your grandchildren or your children of your friends and so on. May Tamar and all the other women that we talked about having an important message to our lives. And may God bless you. Bye-bye. This is your pastor, Yeti.